Chapter 13, Mississippi Mishap. The implied threat in Donna May's remark angered Nancy, Bess, and George. All of them were sure what the girl had in mind. She did not want Alex or Charles to make any dates with Nancy and her friends. She was going to make the boys from Emerson College so jealous they would not dare refuse to come to New Orleans. None of the three girls expressed their thoughts aloud, however. Instead, Bess said sweetly, Oh, I'd adore to see Dave Evans. There's no one I'd rather date than Bert Edelton. George spoke up quickly. Nancy added, I'm sure the boys would have a wonderful time here if they can come, and I must admit that I prefer Ned to any other escort. George grinned. I'll tell you one thing, Donna May. Bert will never consent to putting on the costume of a fairy prince for your ball. Her remark eased the tension, and everyone laughed. The subject was dropped when Alex announced, Now for some more sightseeing. I've rented a launch and we'll show you girls the river. That sounds alluring, Bess commented. The Mississippi is such a romantic river. It's more than that, Alex told her. It's one of the busiest. They drove through several narrow streets until they came to the waterfront, lined with docks and ships at anchor. Donna May said it was one of the most important shipping points in the world. Millions of tons of cargo go through here every year. One thing is of particular interest. The New Orleans port is known as a foreign trade zone. This means that foreign vessels coming in here can unload and have the cargo transferred to another ship going out of the United States without payment of customs duty. By this time, they had reached the dock where the rented launch was tied up. It was a trim craft with a small cabin. The group eagerly climbed aboard, and Alex took the wheel. Soon the launch was out in the middle of the stream. The sightseers looked up and down the river at the great docks, where vessels of various sizes and kinds were moored. See that white boat over there? Donna May pointed. That's a banana boat. It's painted white so the sun will be reflected. In this way, the hold where the fruit is stored remains cool. They passed a small puffing tug, which was pushing a string of cargo boats. George remarked that the little tugs must have tremendous power. They do, said Alex, and of course the flowing river helps a little. It's only when the tugs go upstream that they have to work hard. Part of the tour led past huge grain elevators. Alex remarked, Those long conveyors you see can unload 18,000 bushels an hour onto the ships. Yes, Donna said, and added, The grain barges can hold as much as 3,000 bushels. I suppose, said George, that the bananas are incoming cargo and the grain is outgoing. That's right, Donna May replied. The grain goes to countries in many parts of the world. The New Orleans girl now proudly said that the United States engineers had conquered the problem of floods for the city. It used to be perfectly frightening when the old river overflowed and the levees broke, she said. When the Mississippi goes on a rampage now, some of the water is pumped into Lake Pontchartrain miles above here. The excess is carried through steel-enforced concrete tunnels to a point 15 miles below the city. You wouldn't believe it, but there's a thousand miles of pipe. Presently, Alex turned upstream, and Donna May said she wanted the girls to see some of the plantation homes along the upper river. Soon they left the area of traffic. Only now and then they passed a boat. What a divine place to live, Bess remarked gazing at pecan orchards, framing a lovely old house. Presently, Nancy glanced at her watch. I think we'd better turn back now, she suggested, thinking of the girls' dinner engagement at the Bartolomes. It's getting late. Oh, no, Donna May protested. You haven't seen anything yet. George laughed. I've seen so much, I'm sure I won't be able to remember it all.
Nevertheless, Alex went on for several miles more, with Donna May pointing out the high concrete levees in some places and farmland running right down to the river in others. Again, Nancy asked Alex to turn around. Okay, he agreed, making a wide sweep in the river and coming about at 500 yards from the far shore. Suddenly, the motor began to sputter, and the next moment it stopped. Goodness, what's the matter? Donna May asked. Alex gave a great sigh. We're out of gas. Nancy was angry. Why hadn't Alex checked the tank before they left? Aloud, she merely said, There must be an emergency can on board. All the young people searched. They opened every locker, but there was no extra fuel in any of them. Well, this is a fine mess, George exclaimed in disgust. The Three River Heights girls looked at one another, the same thought in all their minds. Had Alex and Donna May planned this on purpose to keep them from going to the Bartolome home to dinner? If they are guilty, I'm not going to let them get the better of me, Nancy determined silently. Aloud, she cried, Help! Help! Bess and George yelled also. Alex and Donna May sat still, smiling amusedly. When no one appeared in answer to the girl's call, George looked at Alex and demanded, Well, aren't you going to do something? What can I do? The young man replied, shrugging. We'll get back sooner or later. The stream will carry us down slowly, and we'll meet someone who will give us gas. Such a delay was not to Nancy's liking. She decided to do something at once. I'm going for help, she announced. Standing up, she kicked off her shoes and then unfastened the skirt of her three-piece ensemble. Before the others could object, she dived overboard and began swimming with strong strokes for shore. She's crazy, Alex exclaimed. She may never make shore, and if she does, there's probably not a house for miles around. Bess was almost persuaded to his viewpoint, but George said confidently, Nancy will make it all right. Nancy did swim the 500 yards easily. She crawled up the low levee, then disappeared from view. The others waited anxiously. Presently, they heard the hum of a motor starting up, and from around a bend in the river came a small motorboat. In it were Nancy and a middle-aged farmer. On a seat stood a five-gallon can of gas. With little ado, the fuel was poured into the tank of the rented craft, and Alex paid the man. Nancy thanked the farmer for all his trouble and climbed back into the launch. Alex started the motor and headed for New Orleans. Oh, Nancy, you're wonderful, Donna May said. Simply wonderful. I'd never have had the nerve to do that. Bess and George looked at their chum admiringly, adding their praise also. Alex, however, kept silent. Nancy herself merely laughed. I must be a sight, she declared. Bess, lend me a clean handkerchief, will you? With it, Nancy tried to wipe the muddy water from her face, neck, and arms, but with little success. The wind soon dried her hair and clothes. After she had put on her skirt and shoes, Nancy noticed that the launch was going very slowly. She urged Alex to speed up. He made no comment, but did give the craft more power. As soon as they reached the dock, Nancy, Bess, and George hopped out. Thank you so much for a grand trip, Nancy said. Now we must hurry. If you don't mind, we'll grab a taxi back to the parking lot. Then we'll hurry on home. By the time the girls reached Sunnymead, it was already 6.30. Only half an hour before dinner at the Bartolomes. Bess, said Nancy, will you please call Charles's mother and explain why we'll be a little late? I'll dash right upstairs and wash the Mississippi mud out of my hair. And George, will you get some clothes we can wear on our bayou trip tonight and hide them in the trunk of the car? A few minutes later, Bess came to Nancy's room. 
She reported that Mrs. Bartolome had graciously said she would postpone the dinner hour to 8 o'clock. George said the sports clothes and shoes were in the car. By 7.30, the girls were ready to leave. As they walked into the hall, Donna May, looking very attractive in a peach-colored organdy, came from her room. Have a wonderful time, girls, she said. I should warn you, though, that Mrs. Bartolome goes to bed early. You'll be back here by ten. George flushed with anger. She said icily, We'll be here when we get here. Donna May looked as if she had been stung. To ease the tension, Nancy said quickly, Do have a nice time at your dinner party. The three girls hurried from the house and went to Nancy's car. Bess got in front with Nancy, while George seated herself in the rear. As they drove off, Bess said severely to her cousin, Why in the world did you talk like that to Donna May? Do you want to spoil everything for us? If the situation around here gets much worse, Aunt Stella and the Colonel may ask us to leave. I'm sorry, said George, but Donna May makes me positively ill when she gets on her high horse. She certainly has changed, Bess admitted. I'll bet Alex is putting her up to a lot of these things. Nancy was very quiet. So many unexplained things had occurred that now she was alert for trouble at any moment. Cat got your tongue, Nancy? George spoke up. The girl detective laughed. No, she replied, but I have a feeling that we should be extra cautious tonight. Then Nancy added, I've been thinking over what you girls said about Donna May. She did seem very different today, especially when we were on the launch. Up to now, I hadn't thought that she was interested in anything but herself. Actually, she's a very intelligent girl. At that moment, the girls reached the long, tree-lined driveway of Oleander Manor, the Bartolome estate. Nancy began to breathe more easily. She relaxed and leaned back in her seat. Isn't this an attractive... She never finished the sentence. From among the low branches of the tree she was just passing, a stone hurtled toward her. End of chapter 13